can't see it by economic pluralism this time. Uh, we, have a we have two very distinguished speakers tonight, and the topic is an introduction, um, or it's an introduction to post-Keynesianism. Our speakers are Professor Engelbert Stockhammer, who is a fellow Austrian countryman of mine. He is senior lecturer at uh, the pluralist Kingston University, and his research areas include macroeconomics, applied econometrics, financial systems, and heterodox economics. He works heavily with the post-Keynesian study group. And uh, Professor Victoria Chick is Emeritus Professor of Economics at UCL London and is co-founder of the uh, Post-Keynesian Study Group, where she is very active. Her main research interests lie in monetary theory and macroeconomics. More recently, she has been active in founding the group Economists Against Austerity, where she encourages politicians to speak out on, on that front. I hope you enjoyed the, um, the event, and please uh, join me in welcoming our first speaker, Professor Victoria Chick. I've called this talk some post-Keynesian economics because I can't possibly cover it all. That's obvious enough. Um, and um, I've really got sort of four things that I, I want to do. I want to talk about Keynes's way of thinking um, and how it shaped his theory, and the features <coughs> of the economy that he took into account um, when framing his theory, and then <coughs> look in <coughs> more. I'm sorry. Look in more detail uh, at his monetary theory, um, and then just ask uh, briefly uh, uh, about the relevance of that to the crisis. It's kind of a tall order, and I probably won't do it all. Um, first, I thought I'd explain the term post-Keynesian, because it's rather puzzling. Um, in 1971, there was a meeting of the American Economic Association to which Cambridge's own Joan Robinson gave the central lecture, the Ely Lecture. Um, and at that time, Paul Davidson called a meeting of like-minded people who, who were very dissatisfied with Keynesianism <coughs> and felt that it didn't capture Keynes's views at all. Uh, and uh, at that meeting, Joan Robinson suggested that we were post-Keynesian, that is to say, after the Keynesians not after Keynes, but after the Keynesians. But of course, we were after Keynes as well. <clears throat> but we go back uh, to look at Keynes. We are scholars who share his approach to theory and who more or less share his way of thinking. Um, uh, and we also take inspiration from others who share that way of thinking, including, of course, Joan Robinson and Nicholas Caldor and other Cambridge greats. So we look two ways. Um, we need to recover Keynes's way of thinking, um, but because Keynes knew that his theory was historically contingent, we also have to look forward because the economy has changed, and see what's uh, relevant in Keynes's way of thinking to the economy now. I'll probably talk almost entirely about Keynes himself. Engelbert will talk much more about those moves forward to cope with the fact that the economy has changed. But I'll say something about that, too. <coughs> Keynes's view on economic theory <coughs> is perhaps interesting if you've been brought up on a neoclassical textbook. It seems to me, he said, that economics is a branch of logic, a way of thinking. Economics is a science of thinking in terms of models joined to the art of choosing models which are relevant to the contemporary world. This requires, as this was a letter to Harrod, so you refers to Harrod. This requires, as you say, vigilant observation of the actual working of our system. This, uh, there's a typo there. 
Now, visual, uh, vigilant observation uh, of the working of our system is not something which you find very much of in contemporary economics textbooks. Um, so his way of thinking is rather different from the neoclassical way. He starts from a perception of the economy, its institutions and its habits, um, and also from an acceptance of the fact that we live under uncertainty. We do not know the future, <clears throat> and we cannot know it. Um, so we have an imperfect understanding of the world that we're in and the world as it will unfold. Um, by contrast, uh, well, sorry, and yet he argued it was still possible to make sensible decisions. How does one do that? And his treatise on probability was all about that. By contrast, neoclassical economics, that's NCE in my slide, um, start from axioms which aren't really self-evident things at all, built on the concept of rationality, and I put that in inverted commas for good reason, because that rationality requires perfect knowledge and no uncertainty. Um, and they then go on hoping to find universal laws of an economics uh, that is institution-free. <clears throat> now, as I said, Keynes starts from a perception of the economy. How did the economy look when he was writing the general theory? Well, the UK had been in depression since 1921. There was substantial unemployment, and it was, it was worse after 1929 and the Wall Street crash. Um, uh, prices he observed going down as well as up, something I don't think you've ever experienced, with the possible exception of, at the moment of oil prices. Um, <clears throat> the money supply was pretty stable. Um, and um, investment had been low for quite some time, uh, so that there was very little embodied new technology um, and you could regard capital as more or less fixed for most purposes of your argument. Also, um, capital was inadequate to fulfill our needs. There was plenty of scope for new investment. These were the main features of the economy in the 1930s that were built into Keynes's general theory in a way that a lot of people don't perhaps recognize except for the fact that unemployment is the central, or employment, is the central issue that the book addresses. Well, I'm going to skip to his conclusions, which is not the way one ought to do things. I ought to take you carefully through the whole argument, but we haven't got a week. Um, so <laughs> I'm going to skip to the conclusions because I want to emphasize certain aspects of how he got there. First of all, employment is determined by what businesses think they can sell and how much, how much labor they need to make that output. Um, this depends on uh, how much they can sell depends on <coughs> demand. Um, and if there isn't enough demand, you have unemployment. And the economy can get stuck there. He coined the phrase unemployment equilibrium, which to a, a, a neoclassical economist is a sheer contradiction in terms uh, because the market doesn't clear. Um, and he uh, saw no way that the system would adjust automatically to full employment. It could get stuck. Um, the level of economic activity, he reasoned, 
and there was there's a lot to this, um, rests on the level of investment. Investment is the engine of growth for this system. And it depends both on the stream of future profits that investors expect to accrue to this new um, capital equipment and the rate of interest that you have to pay to borrow the money to make the investment. <clears throat> what determines that rate of interest? Well, all his predecessors thought it was the reward for waiting, um, for, uh, and he said, no, no, it's not that. It's the reward for parting with liquidity. Um, and on this basis, he devised uh, a theory of the rate of interest called liquidity preference. Um, and liquidity preference, he gave good reasons uh, to believe, could keep the rate of interest too high to generate enough employment, uh, investment to give us full employment. Um, so it, unlike the neoclassical theorist who says that unemployment is a matter of wages being too high, Keynes said, no, no, it's not that. <coughs> it's that the rate of interest is too high so the so investment is too low, and that's why we have unemployment. It's not what you think, you neoclassical economists, at all. Now I want to comment on this this list. Um, the first thing to notice is that we are dealing all the time with an unknown future. The producers. Uh, don't know exactly what they can sell. They have to and try to anticipate that. Um, they anticipate the level of demand. Um, and uh, this is also true, even more so, for those considering undertaking investment, where the profit stream goes on for the life of the capital equipment. Um, so they have to forecast much further into the future, even than producers do. Um, these expectations made in businesses determine employment. Um, there is no independent labor market. A labor market is subsidiary um, uh, to the market for output. This rep represents a systemic way of thinking. The system as a whole gives him his result, not individual parts, even though from time to time he analyzes those things separately. Labor is powerless to cure its own unemployment um, because there's nothing in it for the employed. They're perfectly happy. Uh, and the unemployed have no voice. Even labor unions uh, aren't going to uh, cater for the needs of the unemployed if that means lowering wages. So there is no way that labor can do anything about the level of employment uh, for the economy as a whole. There's an asymmetry of power. Liquidity preference is a purely financial thing, um, and investment means the purchase of real capital. So the financial circulation and the real economy are intimately connected. Um, it's also true that in liquidity preference, uh, there is a need to uh, make an anticipation of the future, but I haven't said enough to make that obvious to you now. Now, this diagram is a bit horrendous, but um, I want to connect aspects of the way of thinking that characterizes both Keynes and post-Keynesians to some of the deeper elements of the thinking that gave rise um, to the conclusions which I outlined and, and which the comments 
refer to a little bit. I've contrasted post-Keynesian thought with neoclassical thought, but I'll concentrate now on talking you through post-Keynesian ideas. Uncertainty and imperfect knowledge, well, this forecasting of the future into the unknown is all about that. Um, the method, both inductive and deductive, you start with the economy as you understand it and you deduce certain things about the interactions therein. Um, on, ontology means how you see the world. I mean, that's a very bad definition, but it'll do for now. Um, and one of the most important things that um, uh, he came to understand was that the economy wouldn't write itself. It wouldn't return to full employment automatically. He saw the economy as a system, an organic unity, rather than little bits and pieces, atomistic little bits and pieces, not connected to one another. And it was that that made him um, uh, able to understand that the market for labor, insofar as when one can talk about such a thing, is a subsidiary part of the whole story. Uh, and finally, the monetary and the real are inseparable while the neoclassics think that money only determines prices and everything else happens in the real economy. That's all about Keynes's way of thinking and a little bit about how that way of thinking <coughs> generated his, uh, his chief conclusions. Now, what has changed in the economy? How, you know, I've given you a sort of quick sketch of the really important aspects of UK 1930s, um, but we have to see how we, how we look now. Uh, the most staggering thing, I think, really, is that the banking system is out of control, I would say. That's probably contentious, certainly amongst bankers. Um, <laughs> we've had, uh, since the 1970s, substantial inflation thank you, um, uh, of ordinary prices and now asset prices, particularly um, property prices. Then we had the crash, and asset price inflation has, has come up again. Uh, the investment prospect is again weak, but this time it's not so obvious that there's plenty of scope for more capital investment. We may be approaching the stationary state. Um, and then after the prosperous years up to the 1970s, unemployment is a problem again. Uh, and we have a new problem, or at least it's new in our consciousness, that of inequality, which Keynes touched on but didn't analyze in any depth. Um, now, Engelbert will deal with um, effective demand and unemployment, and I want just to um, look a little bit at Keynes's monetary theory and the crash. Um, here are two nice quotes about money, uh, but we haven't got time to deal with them. Uh, <laughs> well, have we? Uh, yeah. Hayek is wonderful. The task of, of monetary theory is to go over the whole thing again and once you realize that money affects everything else in the system. In other words, a, um, a system which has an, a classical dichotomy in it uh, and has no money has to be redone all over again. It's not a matter of tacking things on. M the money supply was pretty stable, um, and uh, the banks were, were quite well under control. Um, Keynes's own view of money and monetary theory. Uh, he contrasted money as a convenient means of effecting exchanges, a convenience, it's neoclassical theory, with what he wanted, uh, an economy in which money plays a part of its own and affects motives and decisions and is, in short, one of the operative factors in the situation. 
It is this we ought to mean when we speak of a monetary economy. So he wanted to go over all the ground again. He wanted to create what he called a money production economy. Neoclassical theory also concentrates on exchange. Money in the general theory is everywhere. Labor contracts for a money wage, not a real wage. Um, saving means putting money into financial assets. The rate of interest is a monetary variable. Firms seek profit, which is sales, a monetary value, minus money costs. And he contrasted the barter economy and the money economy as they were seen by Marx, one where money is just a medium between two levels <coughs> of, of consumption, goods that are exchanged, and a money economy in which uh, M prime differs from M by the amount of profit and sales, C, are in between. So that gives you some idea of the pervasiveness of money in Keynes's general theory. Um, I'm going to skip to the third paragraph of this. Money allows us to keep our options open. Uh, it lulls our disquietude, he said. He was talking about uncertainty. If you're uncertain what to do and you have something that helps you keep your options open, that's a good thing. But it also creates uncertainty because if you keep money aside, firms don't know when you intend to spend it or what you intend to spend it on. And that, helps, that doesn't help them estimate the demand for their output. So it solves some problems and creates others. Um, and he devised this theory of liquidity preference, of the, a theory which determined the rate of interest, which was based on this desire to hold money um, versus investing in things which were less liquid. Um, and he defines liquidity uh, uh, as an asset which is more certainly realizable at short notice without loss. And the most liquid asset is always money. Um, so the rate of interest can be seen as a liquidity premium. Now, he mentioned lots of reasons for holding money, but I want to talk about the last of them, speculation. Um, because that was new. Oh dear, this is small, isn't it? Can you read that? I hope so. Um, <coughs> the speculative motive was a new idea. Keynes was a speculator in real life. Okay. Um, and it, uh, he argued that speculators would seek capital, capital gains and try to avoid capital losses. So they had to estimate what the rate of interest was going to do, because the rate of interest causes capital values to change. And the most important aspect of the speculative motive is that your opinion about what's going to happen to future interest rates can be very volatile. So that the speculative motive and therefore the rate of interest, can move about in very unpredictable wa ways. And in particular, if speculators are pessimistic, the rate of interest can be held up too high, then investment isn't high enough to give us full employment. So you could put the matter in this sort of way, that, that Money, the rate of interest on money limits investment, and that can limit employment. So money is not neutral um, because the behavior of those who want to hold it can have real effects on investment and employment. Now. The banking crisis is a case in which liquidity preference 
uh, plays a Im very important role, although liquidity preference was a topic people hadn't talked about for some time. First of all, the banks got rid of all their liquidity because it doesn't pay very much to hold it, and relied on the wholesale markets to supply them with liquidity when they needed it. The minute the banks showed that they were in the slightest difficulty, the markets dried up. They refused to lend to the banks. The banks had no money, but they had outgoings they had to honor. And so Mervyn King went to the Chancellor of the Exchequer and said, we've got to do something, and bailed them out. Um, Partly, they, uh, so the Bank of England had also <coughs> bought into this liquidity illusion, or they wouldn't have let the banks run down their liquid assets as much as they had. Um, and they also were perhaps seduced by the idea put forward by something called the efficient markets <coughs> hypothesis, that all assets are equally liquid because they're perfectly priced. This was a disaster of economic theory as much as of bank fraud and, and speculation and too much leverage and all the rest of it. And the economic theory was there all the time, and it was Keynes's. Now, as I say, I, I would concentrate mostly on Keynes as the foundation for post-Keynesian economics. I've given you a little bit of an idea of how the economy has changed since Keynes's time and how we might want to move Keynes's theory further forward. Um, and Engelbert has been, of course, in the forefront of doing just that. Uh, and he will talk about that amongst many other things as well. Thank you very much. Well, good evening from my side, and thanks for the invitation. I will, to some extent, cover a similar ground as Vicky, but uh, with a bit of a different structure. Uh, so what I'll be doing is I'll talk about, uh, I'll start out with talking a bit about the foundations, and there I'll highlight on the one hand fundamental uncertainty, and on the other hand social conflict and then effective demand as a unifying theme of post-Keynesian economics. I'll walk you a bit through the macroeconomics of post-Keynesian economics. There in particular, the Keynesian argument that the causality goes from investment to savings rather than the other way around. I'll highlight involuntary unemployment. I'll be a bit brief on the monetary aspect because uh, Vicky has covered them, but I'll talk a little bit about endogenous money creation and about financial instability. And I'll wrap up on uh, contrasting post-Keynesian economics uh, to new Keynesian economics. I'll say also a bit about the, the history uh, and the debates within post-Keynesian economics, and I'll try to finish up with a few words on economic policy. Uh, if some of the, 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 the whole set of slides that you're seeing in front of you is of a longer uh, lecture, so some of that, uh, in particular, comparison with Marx in economics, I'll skip unless uh, you, you want me to talk about it. Now, when talking about post Keynesian economics, I like to use the triangle to highlight three features fundamental uncertainty, social conflict, and effective demand. To some extent, that reflects the history of post Keynesian economics, uh, sort of the Fundamental uncertainty, monetary economics, uh, liquidity preference is a distinct stream within post Keynesian economics. And the side that I'm coming from, Kalecki and macroeconomics, always had a strong emphasis on social conflict, class analysis, and its impact on macroeconomics. Post Keynesian economics in the last 20 years or so has reached a fairly high degree of coherence, uh, different from some other. Uh, schools of, of heterodox economics, and there are several uh, uh, textbooks in post Keynesian economics. And sort of the the uh, what I'm what I'll be presenting as post Keynesian economics uh, in the next 20 minutes is what I think of most post Keynesians by and large agreeing on. First, fundamental uncertainty. 
uh, Vicky has discussed much of that. Fundamental uncertainty is contrasted to situations of risk, thus it refers to situations of general unpredictability of the future. And that has three, at least three very important implications for post-Keynesian theory. The first block is around monetary theory. A theory from that notion of fundamental uncertainty follows a theory of money as a means of dealing with uncertainty as a means of giving you flexibility in the face of uh, uncertainty. And thus, it gives you a very different picture of why people might want to hold money. Mind you, in standard macro models, people essentially hold money because they want to buy stuff. They want to buy things, consumption goods, investment goods. It's a, you sometimes refer to that as transactions demand for money. Uh, it's because you want to buy something. In the Keynesian theory, a big part of what money is, is that you actually precisely don't want to buy anything. In particular, you don't want to buy any financial assets because you're worried what those financial assets might want to do to you. So picture yourself in 2008, somewhere in August, right before things get really bad in September and October. So asset prices, in particular those of the financial assets, uh, of, of financial institutions, are collapsing. What are you doing? You're selling them off. What does that mean for your demand of money? Well, if you're selling all sorts of financial assets, it means you want to hold a lot of money. So in that very situation where you don't want to hold certain financial assets, you suddenly increase your demand of money, not because you intrinsically like those little sheets of paper, but really because it's a reflection of your whole portfolio decision and the fact that you distrust the future. So that's the first part. It gives you a distinct theory of money as dealing with uncertainty. Second, it gives you an understanding or a different understanding of investment behavior. For Keynes, uh, uh, let's start with, with the other side. In, in, a, in a neoclassical framework, investment demand or investment expenditure is part of a proper optimization exercise. You sort of form your rational expectations, your future income streams, uh, you look at your capital stock, you calculate the marginal product of capital. It's really a, a rather technocratic exercise. You have to get, they have to set the marginal product of capital equal to the interest rate. And that marginal product of capital is something that, that's objectively out there. You just have to sort of get the ratios right, but it's out there. In the Keynesian point of view, the history is a fundamentally open process. There is no intrinsically set marginal product, or Keynes refers to it as the marginal efficiency of capital, because history isn't written yet. If you're doing an investment project and that factory is going to sit there for the next 30 years, whatever that marginal product of capital is depends on what's going to happen in the next 30 years. So in that sense, there's no objective value out there. It's a, it's a much more creative process on the part of the entrepreneur. And Keynes was a, a liberal. He, he liked those entrepreneurs. Uh, so for him, that, that, that's a creative process. And that's where the animal spirits come in. Uh, animal spirits in Keynes urge to action rather than inaction. I mean, the, these are quite nervous entrepreneurs that really want to do something. I mean, they're really... Think of them of self-obsessed. Self the, the, the Mark Zuckerberg in the, in the Facebook movie got a big ego and really wants to do something. That's Keynes's entrepreneur. And his investment decision is a lot more about uh, sort of how big is megalomania is than about any rational calculation of uh, the capital stock and its marginal product. Third, uh, is the third implication of uh, fundamental uncertainty is a methodological <coughs> one. Sort of all these optimizing behavior, all these ideas of rationality sort of go out the drain once you think of the world as one of fundamental uncertainty where ultimately people like Socrates know that you don't really know what's going to happen and you're very well aware that th there's limitation to your knowledge of your world. Right, so that's one big block, uh, if you want, that's the, the ontological take that's fundamental uncertainty and that gives you a certain understanding of investment, a certain understanding of monetary theory. The second big block uh, is distributional conflict or class conflict. If you want a broader term, you can also 
call it institutional analysis. From the post-Keynesian point of view, if you want to have a foundation of economics, you really should be looking at sociology, at history, at political science, not at axiomatic mathematics in the way that neoclassical economics does it. So let's try to be a bit more specific about that. Uh, distributional conflict, which I will be using synonymously with class conflict, uh, is pervasive in post-Keynesian economics. Uh, the way it shows up is uh, that uh, in our baseline Kaletsky and macro models, the marginal propensities to consume will be different uh, for workers and for capitalists or recipients of capital income. You can also think of that marginal propensity to consume will be different for the rich and the poor. Uh, the investment decision, which is key in the whole post-Keynesian uh, research program, uh, is an investment decision that's essentially up to the capitalists. It's not uh, the investment decision of workers. Now, that's a very different view uh, from the neoclassical one, because at least in the baseline neoclassical growth theory, of course, it's really consumers that are setting investment because it's really their savings decision that is determining investment. So it, for post-Keynesian, it's clear it's the capitalist doing the investment. And it's thus when Keynes talks about the business climate or the uh, uh, psychological condition of the average entrepreneur uh, that uh, is driving uh, investment. It's also clear for post-Keynesians that there's a fundamental asymmetry of power relations between capital and labor uh, because it's capital that's hiring labor. Now, that's a fairly basic statement, but it's, again, not a trivial statement from a neoclassical point of view. And Paul Samuelson, one of the smarter neoclassical economists, said so explicitly, it doesn't matter whether capital is hiring labor or labor is hiring capital, because there's, it's a free contract. Whoever wants to sign can sign up to it. Whoever doesn't want to do it doesn't. There's, there's no asymmetry of power relations there. Uh, <laughs> And that, of course, is very counterintuitive. Because, I mean, if you ask people whether they're worried about losing their jobs, most people, certainly the low-skilled ones, will be very worried, or will be at least to some extent worried about losing their jobs. And the reason for that is that once you lose your job, it's not straightforward that you find a new one. Again, think of that in contrast to a neoclassical world. A neoclassical, and by neoclassical, I mean the Valrasian one, the, the one with the auctioneer, the <coughs> equilibrium price, market clearing. If you have such a world of market clearing, if you lose your job, you're not worried. You know that you're in a clearing market, you'll find a job, another job, with the same wage, because that's all the marginal disutility of labor and the, uh, all sorts of neat things. Uh, so fundamentally, being unemployed is nothing to be worried about. Why? Well, because in a neoclassical world you have full employment. And if you have full employment, indeed, unemployment is nothing that you worry about. So that's a very different world from the Marxian world, where the industrial reserve arm is always breathing in the neck of workers and thereby disciplining. <laughs> and that's sort of much closer to the world, the mental world, the post-Keynesian are inhibiting, because for them it's also clear that workers are very worried about unemployment. And post-Keynesian economics or Keynesian economics is very much a project that wants to provide analytically and ultimately policy instrument to deal with unemployment and to, to get us closer to a situation of full employment. Now, post-Keynesians or Keynesians in general tend to be quite fond of money and monetary instability. So our class analysis is a bit more complicated than just capital and labor. Usually finance has a role in there, thus the interest rate becomes a distributional variable and so on. Uh, so we often would have three class uh, situations, but the, the basic idea of social conflict, you could extend to other uh, forms of social conflict. So you could also include gender relations along these lines or uh, it's ethnic uh, conflict. Uh, I said uh, social conflict and class relations are important because the effect uh, they affect investment behavior, they affect uh, consumption behavior because different classes will have different marginal propensity to consume. The post-Keynesian theory of inflation is one of un uh, is uh, a theory of unresolved distributional uh, conflicts that articulate themselves 
uh, is inflation as both sides, both capital and labor in the simplest world, are sort of trying to increase the income share. And as an outcome, therefore, uh, you get uh, nominal price inflation. Uh, effective demand is what uh, unites the uh, post-Keynesian or where uh, the post-Keynesian arguments come together. And the principle of effective demand says that it's essentially expenditure that is determining uh, the output level. And expenditures are mostly driven uh, by investment expenditure. That's sort of a theory-driven statement that has to do with the Keynesian theory, animal spirits theory of investment, but it's essentially an empiric uh, assertion that investment is really the most volatile element uh, in GDP and thus is driving uh, uh, expenditures. Um, and that is a uh, illustration of that where I've plotted investment growth and consumption growth uh, in the course of the last uh, 15 years. And that uh, just illustrates that investment, in most cases, uh, is the most volatile component of GDP. Uh, obviously, in small open economy, net exports can have that role as well. In the Keynesian, uh, in the post Keynesian analysis, the three broad groups of markets, goods markets, financial markets, and labor markets, are really quite different creatures uh, and require different, uh, have a ins different institutional background and require a different form uh, of analysis. The labor market uh, in the post-Keynesian analysis is an appendix. It is something that is carried along by the other markets that's very different from neoclassical theory uh, where in the general equilibrium version or in the growth theory, full employment and the clearing of the labor market is at the very core. So for us, the action is going on in the goods market. A lot of what, and what's going on in the goods market depends a lot on animal spirits and investment. And the, uh, some part of that depends on what's going on in financial markets because various financial prices, debt levels, interest rate will affect investment. But either way, uh, the, the labor market is something that is straked along and the feedback of the labor market back to the uh, goods market is a very weak one. And if there's a weak one, it often goes in the wrong direction or in a destabilizing direction. So one of the core arguments of post-Keynesian economics uh, is that if you have a situation of unemployment, what you will get as a result is a fall in nominal wages. We can also think through real wages. And one of the basic post-Keynesian and Keynesian assertions is that if you have such a situation, the adjustment pressures uh, may be destabilizing. So Keynes's point, uh, chapter 19 of the general theory, where he discusses the, change, the effects of changes in money wages, he says, well, think of, of uh, the situation of the 1930s, uh, a recession, high unemployment, wages start to fall. Will that improve employment or not? He says, well, the basic question that you first have to answer is, does that fall in money wages translate into an increase in aggregate demand? Because as long as you don't have an increase in aggregate demand, there's no reason for firms to hire more workers. And then Keynes actually goes through eight different mechanisms and is to some extent agnostic on what direction the effect goes. The majority of effects actually go in the destabilizing way. But his main point is you cannot make a general argument uh, that uh, that fall in money wages will necessarily increase employment. So what are the, the negative effects of that uh, fall in money wages? Well, the first is wages are the most important income of most households, so what you'll get quite straightforward is that you'll have negative effects on consumption demand. And that's actually one of the things that I myself have done a lot of econometric research on. Uh, and what we found there is that if you redistribute income from capital to labor, you'll actually have a positive effect on consumption because workers have a higher marginal propensity to consume. Uh, so that's uh, sort of the, the, the side where the distribution of income uh, matters and where uh, marginal propensity to consume matters. Now, from the capitalist point of view, the question is, well, if you have a, a crisis situation and your unions accept a wage cut, what are you going to do? Are you going to say, well, 
I know that I have difficulty selling what I'm producing because we're in a recession, but because of the market signal that wages are falling, I'm going to hire more workers and thus I'm going to increase production. Or is that capitalist going to say, well, as a matter of fact, I produce all these cars, I can't sell them, so if there's a wage cut, maybe what I should be doing is not hire workers because I don't want to produce more, rather I'm going to pass on that reduction in costs and I'm going to cut my prices. And thereby, I'm not increasing production, I'm not hiring my workers, but I'm contributing to deflation. So that would be the, the Keynesian view of, of, uh, uh, of a recession. And mind you, that situation of a deflation, that's what we actually experienced, uh, most countries in particular Britain experienced in the 1930s, that deflation also means that all indebted units in that economy now have a harder time paying their debt, uh, servicing their debt, paying the principal of their loans because their loans were fixed in nominal terms, but their income is in current prices and thus if you have deflation, the real debt burden goes up. So the short of that is, from the Keynesian point of view, there's no positive self-adjustment on the labor market. There's no anchor of the economy in some natural rate of unemployment. Rather, unemployment is something that's determined by the goods market. Um, Vicky has already talked about uh, the liquidity preference in uh, Keynes' monetary theory. What I would want to add is uh, the notion of endogenous money. Post-Keynesians uh, subscribe to a view of endogenous money and in that view it's money is essentially created as a side effect of the lending decision of commercial banks. Essentially, when a bank gives you a loan, what you'll find the next day is money on your bank account. It's that money on your bank account that the Bank of England, by the end of each quarter, is calculating as the money supply. So from the post-Keynesian point of view, and as a matter of fact, a uh, substantial part of mainstream e economists, uh, in particular the Bank of England, are slowly converging to that view, uh, money is created endogenously, the central banks are not in control of the money supply, but rather they are setting the base uh, line interest rate. Uh, and it's the commercial banks that are creating, that are extending loans and thereby creating money. Now, that has uh, two important implications. On the one hand, it gives uh, the, the economy, the real economy, a lot more flexibility. And that is also why Keynesians think that investment is never fundamentally constrained by savings, by uh, uh, the non-consumption of households. It can, however, be constrained by the availability of finance depending on whether banks are willing or not willing to lend. Uh, so th that's the first part. Savings is not a constraint on investment. However, uh, it doesn't always have to work in a positive way. That endogenous money creation can also be used for speculation and to the extent that banks uh, or uh, the public use uh, credit to, in, uh, to buy uh, assets, say houses in Britain, real estate, it will lead to price inflation uh, uh, of that uh, non-reproducible -reprodu asset uh, and can thereby destabilize the economy. Uh, I'm almost out of time, so what do I want to say about uh, the streams of post Keynesian economics? I think <coughs> I'll keep that for the question and answer if there are questions in that direction. Uh, I do want to say a few things uh, in terms of the differences to new Keynesian economics. New Keynesian economics in various guises are picking up some of the arguments that post Keynesians uh, have made. Think of uh, Larry Summers discovering secular stagnation is an argument uh, that post Keynesians would have made a long time ago. Uh, also, the, some uh, new Keynesians versions of the Nairo theory uh, have some similarity of, with post Keynesian arguments uh, of conflict inf inflation. But the key difference is twofold. New Keynesians in the uh, 1990s have essentially uh, accepted 
the new classical battle cry of micro foundations. Any proper macroeconomics has to be based on optimizing behavior. Uh, you essentially have to start building an uh, economic model by writing down a utility function. And that is something that most post Keynesians would reject. New Keynesians deviate from the new classicals by saying, well, the fact that we're doing micro foundations doesn't mean that we accept market clearing. And there's all sorts of constellations where those optimizing assumptions will be consistent with non clearing markets. Yeah? So that's the new Keynesian project. But the new Keynesian project, except those micro foundations, except optimization, except rationality. And as a side effect of that, you get, say, new Keynesian DSG models nowadays that have pseudo IS curves, where it's really, again, the intertemporal utility maximization uh, that is driving macroeconomic behavior and not investment uh, expenditures. Uh, and in these models, you also don't have a financial sector properly uh, because you don't need one because there's no fundamental uncertainty, thus, there's no need for people to hold money. Um, post Keynesian economics gives you a very different view uh, of economic policy uh, and a very different division of labor between different parts of economic policy. At the very core of the post Keynesian, or indeed of the Keynesian project, uh, is a vision that capitalism, uh, uh, monetary production economies, market economies will not gravitate to full employment. Thus, if you want full employment, you gotta do something to get there, and you gotta use fiscal policy <coughs> and monetary policy accordingly. Um, that means that in, post, in a post-Keynesian view, you wanna subordinate fiscal policy to achievement of high employment. There is therefore no need for a balanced budget necessarily over the business cycle because there's no built-in mechanism in market economies that would ensure that on average over the business cycle you're approaching full employment. Uh, you would also uh, subordinate to a significant extent monetary policy to that aim. I realize, uh, give me one more minute if to, to finish that slide, but I'll try to wrap up. Uh, there's no point in particular in monetary policy to think of uh, in post Keynesian economics to think of monetary policy as primarily target the price level. That makes sense if you think of uh, economics in terms of a classical dichotomy and as uh, the central bank setting an exogenous money supply. In the post Keynesian world, both doesn't hold true. There's no classical dichotomy uh, and the central bank is not setting the money supply and thus there's no privilege for, the, for monetary policy to deal with inflation. Uh, so how would post-Keynesians fight inflation? Inflation from a post-Keynesian view is the side effect or the outcome of unresolved distributional <coughs> conflict. And what you have to do is you have to create compromises to in a way disarm this uh, distributional conflict. In other words, you want to create collective bargaining structures and you want to create uh, social compromises. Uh, financial markets uh, from a post-Keynesian view are a source uh, of potential instability precisely because the ability of uh, financial institutions to create money and to create, uh, and, uh, to create credit, and that is at the very heart uh, uh, of financial instability. And with that, I apologize for going over time. <laughs>